Hello, Mehdi. Can you hear me? Uh, Hassam, I can hear you perfectly, yes. Okay. You're not able to open your camera? Uh, let me try again. Please. Uh, it says that it cannot start the video because the, ho uh, the host has stopped it. Okay. Can you try now? Uh, yes. Here we go. Can you see me? Oh, sounds perfect. Yes, perfectly. Yeah, and always a pleasure seeing you. Likewise, likewise. Uh, let's wait. For, let's wait for a couple of minutes till everyone comes, and then we're ready to start. Sounds sounds great. Yeah, you can uh, share your presentation. Uh, yes. Uh, let me try to share my screen. Uh, perfect. Yes, we can now see it perfectly. Cool. OK. So three minutes, and we will start. OK, perfect. In terms of, uh, in terms of the flow, um, am I just, is it one shot I present, then we move to Q&A? Or, or do you want to stop me during the presentation and ask some questions? Yes, it, it's, it would be perfect if you, you finished your presentation and then we move to Q&A. Sounds great. Perfect.
I see that there were some uh, some technical issues during the last presentation. So hopefully this one will go smoothly. I tried to yeah. check the internet connection <laughs> before the calls. Hopefully we should be yeah. on my end. I really hope so. Yeah, and you know here the internet connection in Egypt is not uh, at its best. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, hopefully things turn out good for us uh, today. So we almost have 100 participants, so I guess we're uh, we're good to go. So it's already 6 uh, p.m. So hello everyone. My name is uh, Hossein Mahmoud, and uh, I work for uh, GIZ Egypt. We're uh, very, very, very glad in partnership with the Central Bank of Egypt, specifically uh, the fintech unit, fintech Egypt. Uh, we're very glad to uh, announce and uh, present the, uh, as part of the Fintech Egypt Dialogue the GIZ Finance Summer School, which is basically a five webinars on different uh, futuristic topics and trends uh, that is related to financial technology in Egypt. So uh, last the time we had uh, Talal uh, from CoinMina, and he uh, thankfully gave us a very interesting presentation about blockchain and decentralized finance and what is the future of this area. Today, I'm very, very excited and I'm very much looking forward to learn from Mehdi Tazi, uh, the chief business officer of Lean Technologies on open banking. You know, open banking has been uh, a very uh, uh, famous topic recently. Uh, regulators are starting to looking at it, uh, startups, uh, corporates, banks, everyone is starting to see open banking and speak about a future, uh, the future of what, what they call open finance. So I'm, I'm very much looking forward to learn from Mahdi about open finance and how is this will create difference for financial inclusion in Egypt and, and hopefully for the MENA region as well. So yeah, I, I leave you uh, with Mahdi for like a very insightful 40 minutes. And uh, we're very much looking forward, Mehdi. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. The floor is now all yours. Thank you for the for the warm intro and 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 kind invitation. It's a pleasure to be uh, to be here today. Pleasure uh, to 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 speak with you today, uh, everyone. I actually had a catch up with with Talal. So uh, earlier today, uh, believe it or not, we work together. Also, he's a, he's a client of these technologies, and uh, he gave me a little brief uh, about how the panel works. Um, so uh, a little bit about myself before, uh, for everyone's context. Uh, my name is Mehdi Tazi. I'm, I'm half Moroccan, half Tunisian. I'm uh, the chief business officer at Lean Technologies. Uh, I started my career at uh, the Boston Consulting Group in, in, in uh, doing management consulting. Uh, and uh, soon after, I uh, decided to work for a financier called Michael Milken, who asked me to, me and, me, me and my team to lead his, uh, his financial uh, think tank expansion into the Middle East and North Africa. I actually moved to Dubai back in 2016. I had never been there, but uh, developed a real passion uh, for, for, for the region. During one of my trips uh, to the region, I had the pleasure to meet uh, Hisham and Aditya, who are the CEO and, and who are the current CEO and, and, and chief product officer at Lean. And, and they started telling me about, you know, both of them were studying together at Stanford University. Um, and uh, Hisham grew up in Saudi in the Eastern province. Aditya is Indian originally, but grew up in Bahrain. And both of them had plans to come back to the region to really essentially start uh, uh, building the next generation of FinTech innovation in the region. Um, and both of them realized that the real problem was the infrastructure layer, the fact that open banking hadn't been democratized in the region, and they saw a huge opportunity. After speaking about this opportunity at length with them, I actually decided to initially invest in the business. And, uh, and, and shortly after, within a couple of months, I, I actually decided to join the business. So I'll tell you a little bit, I'll give you a quick introduction on on open banking and why I believe it's so exciting. And I think it's really the, the, the most uh, sort of uh, the, the, the biggest innovation in the financial services industry over the past, uh, over the past decade. So um, the flow of the agenda will be introduction to open banking. Uh, then we'll touch upon a couple of use cases. I'll give you a quick introduction to Lean as obviously it, it, uh, as it relates to open banking. Then I'll give you actually a couple of, of, of videos so that you can get a feel of, 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 of real at regional applications that are using open banking services. Uh, then move on to uh, um, 
to Egypt. I, I believe there's there's a, a lot of uh, Egyptians on this on, on on this on this call. So I'll I'll make sure to just uh, talk about the impact of open banking and open finance on Egypt. And finally, obviously, we'll leave some some time for Q and A. So what is open banking? Um, it's a bit of a catch-all word uh, for, and it means different things to different people. Uh, it was initially the first definition of open banking was introduced as a regulation. Open banking was basically a regulation that was introduced in the UK that was mandating uh, uh, several financial institutions, banks and non-banks, to develop a certain set of APIs, application programming interfaces, to enable uh, third-party applications, be it fintechs and other type of merchants, to access the customer's bank accounts, financial data, and, and payments. So that is really the regulatory side of open banking. At its, but 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 the, really the guiding principle and how the, the, the definition evolved over time is really just open banking is essentially a secure way for customers to take control over their financial data and share it with trusted organizations other than their bank. Um, and if you take these two definitions together, what you realize is, is really open banking is an industry shift that is opening up access to financial data. And this will enable innovation and increasingly uh, more competition in the financial industry uh, globally uh, and, 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 and the region as well. So who are the key players in this space? Um, actually, I'll, I, I won't go in order here. I'm gonna start with regulators. Uh, well, I'll start very macro and, and go a little bit more micro. Uh, with regulators. Where regulators, as relates to open banking, are central banks and securities markets regulators who supervise the ecosystem and dedicated entities within or independent of the regulator. They're tasked with ensuring smooth uh, implementation of open banking within their, their respective markets. So to give you an example, a perfect example is would be the, the Central Bank of Egypt uh, in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in Egypt will be regulating all the banks and making sure that the open banking specifications are properly applied. As you may know, Saudi Arabia earlier this year introduced uh, their open banking framework. They announced that by 20, early 2022, open banking will be implemented and launched. They will be following a certain set of standards and they've already started defining which type of API specifications the banks uh, need to follow in order to ensure uh, some standardization in sort of the, the, the way third parties can, can access this data from, uh, from the banks. Obviously, the, the, at the heart of open, open banking will be the financial institutions, i.e. the banks and, insur and insurance companies, uh, but mostly banks in the first phase, uh, who need to create basically these APIs to enable uh, 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 users to share their data, host, which is currently custodiated by the bank with third parties. Um, in between that, we have uh, fintechs who basically need, uh, who are the, 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 the beneficial, uh, the, the beneficiaries of this data, um, who basically the users pass the data to the fintech through open banking services, but you, you, most of the time you'll have an, app, an API aggregator sitting in the middle uh, who's responsible basically for intermediating. They're really acting as the pipes uh, to share the information, to pull the information from the bank and share it with the third party upon the customer's consent. The main beneficiary of this, uh, of this uh, movement is really the end user who is basically able to now make uh, better use of their data and make better financial decision as a result of sharing their, 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 their data with, with third parties. Um, if we move on to the next slide, uh, I, banking. So the traditional banking model, as you know, 10 years, 10, 15 years ago, uh, if you needed uh, to access any type of financial services, you went to the bank. That was the go-to place for any type of financial services. If you wanted to open a checking account, you went to the bank. If you wanted to open a savings or credit, uh, or, or to get a credit card, you went to the bank. Similarly, if you wanted to apply for a mortgage, any type of consumer loan, 
you went to the bank and uh, probably even sometimes when you wanted to invest your money, you would go to your wealth manager within your bank. Uh, so th this essentially caused, uh, like the banks were really bundling uh, financial services together and they were the, custo the custodian of, of their users' financial data. The users didn't have a seamless way to access their financial data. It was all custodian, uh, custodian by the bank. So financial institutions had full control over customers' financial data, and they could decide basically if they wanted to share it with certain partners based on their economic benefits. In reality, um, the data pertains to the customer. Uh, the customer is the rightful owner of this data. So through open banking and through these application programming interfaces, the consumers can, can basically are empowered to share their financial data with third parties and financial institutions are essentially mandated to pass on this data. And so as, as you can see in the flow, the consumer doesn't no, no longer needs to go to their bank to get a PDF statement and share it with the bank. They can actually give permission to access to an aggregator or to the TPP directly to go and essentially pull this data directly from the bank. And we're talking about open banking. I just want you to realize also that this is not like an emerging, uh, an emerging uh, uh, sort of a movement or a regulation. It's happening globally. So as you can see in green, you'll have the, the regulated, the regulation driven markets. Uh, this includes uh, primarily the EU, uh, but other countries like, like, like Brazil, like India, and, and, and many other countries globally. And in blue, you'll have the market-driven um, uh, countries such as the US, uh, the UAE is a great uh, regional example. And so far, Egypt would be counted towards uh, a market-driven market, uh, a market-driven approach. Uh, this might evolve over time. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, 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 I'm looking to engage with, this, uh, with the Central Bank of Egypt to understand a little bit more about what, what are the plans for for open banking and, and I'm coming to Egypt hopefully next week to have some engaging conversations around it. Uh, but I'll, I'll just deep dive a little bit more about what it means to have a market, uh, to, 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 to be a market driven uh, with regards to open banking or regulation driven. Market driven really means that countries, uh, those are those countries who do not formally have uh, uh, compulsory open banking regimes mandating data sharing frameworks between TPPs and banks. So basically there's no central regulator that are forcing the banks to connect, uh, to, to build these APIs and forcing them to, uh, uh, to share this data with third parties uh, upon the customer's consent. And, and, and therefore in a market driven, in, in, a, in, a, in countries that are market driven, uh, it really comes down to players finding bilateral agreements and, and voluntary industry associations and standards from, uh, for, for competitive differentiation. So what, again, what it means, it means that banks and fintechs need to work together to identify what are these partnership opportunities that will enable consumers to share their data freely between banks and, and uh, between different market players. Um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, US, uh, UAE, Japan, uh, and, and, and many others. Here's a quick uh, slide on the uh, adoption of open banking services in market uh, in, 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 in countries that have a mar market driven approach. Um, it, the, in the US, uh, since 2016, uh, there's been a compounded annual growth rate of 171.7% uh, in, in the number of con uh, open banking linked uh, accounts. Uh, more than 260 million bank accounts connected through open banking in the US. That's more than half, uh, like about 75% of the population in the US. Um, and, and similarly, you can see that this really drove uh, fintech adoption uh, in, 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 the, in the United States, which obviously the leader in terms of, 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 of fintech. Uh, with more than 206, uh, 200 and, and 2,600 uh, fintechs uh, using open banking services. Um, 
So we're, we're going to touch upon a little bit more about uh, sort of the regulation driven. Regulation driven essentially are markets whose national regulatory bodies create a framework behind data sharing between banks and, and fintechs. A perfect example is the is the UK and the and the EU. And essentially, what you see there is a little bit more openness in the in the market because there are clearly def it's clearly defined. The, the frameworks are clearly defined for banks to develop a certain set of APIs following a certain set of specifications, which are basically almost standardized. And uh, for fintechs, uh, there are regulated fintechs that are basically granted a license to consume this data upon the customer's consent. Uh, Saudi Arabia and Bahrain are, in this case, like the, the two first regional countries to have uh, adopted open banking. Um, quickly on open banking in the in the in the UK, uh, very fast adoption. Uh, it was introduced. Uh, I, I, regulation, uh, regulatory driven markets usually take a little bit more time to get up and running. Obviously, because uh, the, number one, the central bank needs to define the the specifications, to come up with the guidelines, and 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 you have a, about like a one to two year ramp up period for banks to actually develop those APIs that th third party applications can consume. Uh, so it started later than, than, than the U.S., but it's so even faster adoption, growing at 419% uh, uh, over the past four years. Um, that number is actually the number of API calls, uh, uh, the number of, of calls that uh, fintechs make, uh, but it's a good proxy for, 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 for the growth of the industry. Uh, the Open Banking Implementation Entity forecasts that the total uh, market value of open banking by 2026 will be around $43 billion, which is uh, pretty big, and it will have a, a 1.3, will generate $1.3 billion uh, uh, in, in, for the GDP of the UK by 2024. Um, 24.7 million uh, open banking users. Uh, I'm not sure if this tests around Europe or, or, or just the UK. That sounds a little bit big for the UK. Um, so quickly, on the evolution, people talk about open banking, people talk about open finance, what's the distinction between the two? Well, open banking was basically the initial step and, and it was the, 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 the foundations behind uh, more open data sharing for, uh, for any type of institution. You really start with open banking, uh, uh, with banks being mandated to share their data with third parties. And then you extend the pie and start including non-bank financial institutions. You start including insurance companies that are now have to, to share their data. And open data moves into really any type of industry uh, participant would have to share their data. And we're going really into open data. I'll touch upon a little bit more on that. So open banking uh, started with, with banks, uh, fintechs, and other uh, PSPs. And essentially, the main use cases behind it were personal finance management application. Uh, I'll touch a little bit more on the use cases after uh, uh, business finance management applications, credit scoring, were, were the main use cases behind open bank. There's a lot more, but those were the initial ones. Uh, as you move towards open finance, uh, you really have enhanced PFMs because you, you basically open up the, the data sources. More, 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 more banks, more, fit, more insurance companies, more type of uh, industry players that will now be building these APIs to allow their users to share their data with any type of third party. And lastly, which is the open data. So now think about uh, your, your, your insurance provider, think about like your uh, energy, like where you, like your energy provider, your, 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 hosp your healthcare hospital, all of these actually have a lot of data on you, on, on their users, on their customers. Um, and, and this data is basically custodied by a single entity. But again, this data actually pertains to the customer. So open data is really an, another guiding principle, which, which says that all these type of businesses will basically need to open this data for third party uh, to to share it with third parties. Uh, so to just uh, to just talk about a little bit of, about sort of like the 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 the, the building blocks uh, that ensure uh, an efficient and secure operation in the open banking finance uh, ecosystem. You have the regulatory frameworks. 
uh, which are basically le legal mechanisms placed by regulators that exist on a national level, usually, uh, in order to supervise the open finance ecosystem. You do, so that's not just central banks. It actually, for example, in the UAE, where you have the differentiation between offshore and onshore, uh, actually the ADGM and the IFC, which are um, uh, offshore, uh, uh, offshore regulators, more the DFSA actually and the, uh, and the ADGM's FSRA, are offshore regulators that also came up with their own open banking regulations. Um, uh, to, to basically just, th those are really the guiding principles. Then you have the ADPI standards, which basically uh, are standards uh, that uh, the regulator defines in order to, to, to give some guidance to banks on how they should be, how these APIs should be designed. There's some, sometimes there's, there's, there's banks will, will develop uh, their APIs in different standards, and sometimes it causes a little bit of confusion uh, for third parties and how to best consume them. Uh, I don't think API should be fully standardized. I don't because uh, you essentially uh, move at the pace of the slowest bank. Uh, putting too much standardization actually hampers innovation. But there should be somewhat uh, some guidelines on how they should be uh, de developed uh, to uh, make sure that there's a lay level playing field and that everyone is actually implementing uh, these APIs. Otherwise, there's causes too much confusion. So I'm really prone to find a, 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 a um, um, so somewhere in the middle, not too much standardization, uh, but but also some guiding principles. Uh, consent management, which is basically the security measures and guidelines to ensure customer data privacy while sharing it with, third, with TPPs. Perfect example is uh, Saudi Arabia and, and Egypt's data protection laws, uh, which basically mandate TPPs and any sort of market participant to store the data locally meaning that any TPPs and, and with the rise of cloud providers globally, a lot of TPPs store their, their data on AWS cloud in the UK. If you're a Saudi company, you cannot do that. AWS is not present in Saudi. You are, as, as, and as a Saudi TPP, you are not able to host your data on AWS service uh, uh, overseas. So uh, essentially, it mandates uh, TPPs to find local cloud providers. There are several in 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 uh, in Saudi, so such as Oracle, uh, as OCI, or you basically host it on premise, uh, which is another way to basically store the data. That was the old way before the revolution from AWS. Uh, the fourth point is basically the licensing process. Who are the who are the regulated participants? Is a TPP, should a TPP be granted access? Uh, can, is a TPP licensed in order to uh, access these APIs from a bank? Uh, it's, it's important because some players are actually a little bit less serious and you do not want to be, as a regulator, you do not want your, your, the end users, the population essentially to start sharing data with malicious players. So that's really important to come up with with the right licensing process shouldn't be again too thorough. It should be some, some somewhat flexible, but it should be um, somewhat. Uh, so like th there needs to be a clear uh, uh, regulator who can oversee sort of the market participants. The dispute management fraud and, and, and directory services. Uh, okay, so you're you're an end user. What is uh, and 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 you claim that a that an aggregator or a third party uh, misused the data. What are the, the mechanisms in place to basically come up with uh, 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 an efficient way to solve this problem? It should be clearly defined again, who's liable for what. Uh, the connectivity hub and aggregators. Uh, this is exactly what we do at Lean. I'll touch a little bit uh, upon that, but essentially uh, open banking is complex um, and, and uh, you have aggregators are basically uh, specialized uh, market participants that ensure that the infrastructure is 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 uh, is stable. So basically, they really intermediate the relation between the banks and fintechs, providing a universal API that enables fintechs to connect to their end users' bank accounts. I'll touch upon that a, a little bit more later in the presentation. So what are the use cases? Uh, I'll talk about sort of really the the high level, the like the the main ones. Uh, that was that were enabled by open banking, and then we can actually uh, touch upon more use cases 
um, during the Q&A. So personal finance management applications. Um, the, again, the core of a personal finance management application is an application that enables users to aggregate the balance uh, they have in multiple bank accounts. Users before it had, had trouble, users with more than one bank account had trouble having a clear uh, financial view and, and understanding how, how the, 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 the real uh, balance in, in, in their accounts, the total balance in their accounts. So personal finance management applications essentially allow you to, to basically aggregate the data, aggregate your balance into an, an account and get a consolidated view of your financials. This goes at the data, uh, at the balance layer, so aggregating the total balance in your accounts, but also at the transactions. So if you aggregate your transactions, having uh, instead of having your transactions uh, custodied in silos, you are able to better understand how you're spending your money. I'm sure you have a one card, the one bank account where you actually do use mostly for FNB and. And, and another card, which is mostly for entertainment because you have a Netflix account uh, somewhere else in the world. That uh, PFM enables you to basically aggregate all of your transactions and understand how much are you spending on, uh, on, um, uh, on FNB, how much are you spending on, on, on entertainment, and that gets better. So what was the problem that uh, open banking solved in this case? The, 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 the PFMs didn't have a seamless way to connect to their end users' bank accounts. Before, the PFMs essentially were asking the users to download a PDF from their bank account, pass it on to the PFM, who could then take all of the data, put it into an Excel, turn, turn it from PDF to an Excel, and then take that data and ingest it in their model so that this data would go into their application. This is a very friction prone process. Like it's the, the, the user experience is really terrible. And, and, and it's a re, like, there's no way to constantly refresh the data. Every time you need to refresh the data, you actually need to go back to your bank and ask for a new PDF. What open banking allows you to do is essentially to pull all the data from the bank through an API uh, and pass it on directly upon the customer's consent, pass it on directly to the, to the PFM. So you get your data in real time and have an actual view of your fin uh, of your financial life and how you're 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 doing financially at any point in time. That's really the the key principle behind the PFM. On the buy now pay later side, I'm sure you've heard like this uh, about buy now pay later. For those who don't know, essentially it's a it's a a sort of a, a type of applications that en enable that grants you a, a, a loan. Um, read your credit line at the point of checkout. So let's say you go and spend on Amazon. Now through uh, in Amazon, you have Afterpay that enable that will basically grant you a consumer loan, uh, which uh, will be repayable about around uh, like three or four installments, depending on the solution over time. So if you do not have enough money right now, you can still buy the good, and when you receive your next salary, hopefully in like the next two three weeks then you can repay it in tranches. That's the really what the buy now pay later solutions are doing. Now, however, you have, you have to understand buy now pay later are essentially lenders and with lending there comes risk. So the problem for, lend, uh, for buy now pay later is this, they, they, they had to rely on, on credit bureaus which whose data is basically a little bit, if you rely on a credit bureau, it's a little bit outdated. Uh, number one, and, and, and also credit bureaus are, are not transparent. So they couldn't, uh, basically, they would have to rely on the credit bureau's credit score in order to issue a loan, uh, but they couldn't make the use of that data from the credit bureaus to build their own logic on how they should be underwriting this loan. Again, through open banking, you have the ability, uh, consumers have ability to share, to link their bank account share all of their data to so their balance, all of their transactions for the buy now pay later to get the data instantly and on the spot have a, an algorithm that will basically assess the, the ability to, to for the consumer to repay a loan. And so that's how at the point of checkout within a matter of seconds, a consumer could be granted a consumer loan and go and spend more money on Amazon. That's on the buy now pay later side. And don't worry, I'll, I'll actually touch upon those use cases with a little bit more uh, in a, uh, in a, uh, in, in, I'll deep dive a little bit more into that into the consumer flow. 
Uh, robo advisory, just peer to peer, it was another type of lender. So I'll just skip that for the purpose of this uh, presentation. Uh, robo advisory. Robo advisors is essentially uh, a new uh, a new way to invest your money. Uh, basically, they uh, automate the way you uh, you invest your money, and basically you in invest in predefined portfolios of ETFs. Therefore, minimizing the, the, the type of fees, and uh, it really becomes a passive investment where you have certain set type of algorithms that will basically uh, redefine your portfolio over time and try to optimize it to generate more returns. Uh, however, the key problem behind it is robo advisors didn't have a seamless way to fund their accounts. Uh, if you are a robo advisor, you have to understand that the business model. Is, uh, is such that you have high volume, but very low margins. Because of ETFs, do not, the ETFs do not make a lot of money. They charge very little commissions to the users. And so their margins were, th were tiny. Robo advisors could not accept credit cards or debit card transactions, which charge uh, 2.5 to 3%. Uh, so basically, if they had a user invest $100, um, uh, through uh, by topic up uh, by paying with their with their credit card or debit card really becomes a negative margin business. Uh, an ETF today does not generate 2.5 to 3 percent, so you actually get a negative return on your investment. Uh, so the way they used to they actually used to rely on on manual bank transfers, and manual bank transfers are uh, number one terrible exper user experience, and they're also uh, a lot of friction. And 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 and, um, and and prone to error. So basically, the robo advisory would give you their IBAN. You would have to take their IBAN, log out of the app, go into your bank account, authenticate in your mobile bank application, enter the IBAN, uh, add the, the add the older bank all the all the robo advisors bank details, send that money. Uh, if you do not have a beneficiary cool off period in the UAE, for example, it's, the UAE is famous for having. Uh, uh, beneficiary cool off, which basically uh, force users to wait 24 hours uh, before before being able to make a transfer. So you can, as you can see, this is very very um, uh, inefficient. Through open banking, again, users can connect their bank accounts and seamlessly uh, into the robo advisors and seamlessly initiate a transaction from within the application of the user. And uh, once again, I'll, I'll deep dive on, on that uh, with, with real case studies. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more on, uh, on why we started uh, Lean, uh, Lean Technologies as it relates to open banking. Open banking is great because it, it forces banks to enable uh, fintechs to access uh, their, uh, their bank account. Before that, there was no, there's no, uh, systematic way for 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 fintechs to get access to their customers' bank accounts. So it was really uh, prohibiting innovation. If you think about it, buy now, pay later, they couldn't connect to their end users' bank account, and so they didn't get the data in order to issue a loan. Uh, similarly, a PFM had to download the CSVs every time in order to update the data, and and vice and 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 so forth. And Sarwa couldn't actually fund their account; they had to realize to rely on, on manual bank transfer. So open banking solved this problem, but you have to understand that as a FinTech operating, for example, in the region, uh, in the MENA region, you operate one in a fragmented market that has different regulations, that has different API standards, and with 350 plus uh, financial institutions that you need to connect to. And this is not your core offering. Your core offering as a, you know, as a buy now pay later is to issue loans to come up with good credit algorithms and so forth. Um, and so, as you can see, for a fintech, the, the guiding principle is the, the direct integrations are not scalable. Um, they, uh, they require a lot of uh, engineering effort. They re also require a lot of maintenance. Those connections break. These APIs get updated. And every time an API is updated, the fintech needs to go back and rebuild the integration and upgrade it, update it. Uh, that's, that's not a fintech's core job. And if you take it into an ecosystem view, it actually becomes really overwhelming because you have like in the region, thousands of fintechs needing to connect to 350 plus banks 
And that becomes a really overwhelming uh, sort of uh, uh, a really overwhelming process. Um, and so what's the solution to that? Well, at Lean, what we essentially uh, uh, wanted to build is uh, what we're building is we bridge the gap between uh, between the most innovative fintechs and the financial institutions. On one end, we go and build API integrations uh, with all of the financial institutions in the region, and we provide a single universal API for fintechs to connect to all of the financial uh, institutions in the region. I'll actually show you how it works, but uh, essentially it's one integration and fintechs get access to all of the banks in the region. Our core job is essentially to build this integration and maintain them, providing them with the best connectivity in the market. Uh, so uptime, uh, quality of the integrations, uh, bank coverage, those are our key KPIs in the business. So, so the core functionality uh, that we offer is to connect to the user's bank account, right? Uh, we enable fintechs to connect to their user's bank account by building these integrations with all the financial institutions. So that's the core functionality. In terms of products, it's threefold. On one end, we have a data API that enables uh, that enable fintechs to access uh, their customers' financial data. We have insights, which is, are basically data enrichment, uh, or there, there are data enrichment capabilities that are built through AI and, and ML insights, um, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning insights on, on, uh, on the run through their customer data in order, in order to enrich the data. And lastly, which is the payment solution, essentially initiating bank-to-bank -bank transfers natively within an application. Uh, I'll, talk, I'll deep dive a little bit on the three. So on, on the data API, what we're able to do is essentially access real-time data from the customer's bank account. By getting their consent, we essentially can verify the customer's identity and pass this data to the fintech. This data, your, your identity is actually stored in your bank account. You do not realize it every day, but if you go on your bank account today, you'll find your full name, you'll find your address, you'll find your nationality. All this data is used for KYC purposes. Sometimes your national identity number is there, right? Because you actually, banks have a very thorough KYC process. And so basically we're essentially piggybacking on, on the, the KYC of the bank in order to share this data with third parties. This, these third parties can also use that for their own KYC purposes. Then you have the accounts and balances. Every type, uh, every type of bank account, uh, or we call them entities, has several sub-accounts. So you have your checking, your savings, you have your credit card account, you have sometimes your, your mortgage, different type of loans. All of these represents uh, accounts and each of these have an associated balance. We're able to pull the balance in each of these accounts and pass it on to third parties so that they have uh, much better quality data on their customers. For example, if you're going to go and apply for a loan, then your, uh, your balance says a lot about your ability to repay that loan over time. Um, so this data is leveraged for third party applications in order to extend uh, a loan to a certain type of uh, to, to their customers who willingly share their data. The third point is uh, to get a direct feed of the transactions. As you can, every time you want to check, uh, where every time you you'll always every time you spend your money, you'll receive a notification from your bank account. And actually, this data, this transaction, is actually stored in your bank account. And uh, this enables a uh, certain type of applications such as fintechs, um, such as sorry, personal finance management applications, to aggregate all of these transactions and derive more insights such as like how much is a certain customer spending on uh, FNB, how much is uh, a certain customer spending on entertainment. And it allows the end user to start budgeting a little bit better, understanding where they're spending their money, where they should be spending a little, a little bit less and saving a little bit more. So that's the data API. Now, the data API is very much raw data that we took from the account, right? We're really just the, 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 the pipes that takes this data from the bank and pass it on to the FinTech. We didn't want to stop there. So what we added to our platform is essentially data enrichment services through AI, through artificial intelligence and machine learning. I'm sure all of you in the Middle East uh, know how uh, 
the, the, the data that actually shows up in your bank account does not make any sense. You'll oftentimes see the transaction description saying Lulu Hypermarket XXX0075. Um, and you actually do not know where who's the merchant, uh, where you spent your money, and you're left clueless about, about the transaction. So what we essentially built, it's a database of all the merchants in the region, including the likes of Alpha Tame Group, the likes of Al Shaya Group, the likes of Orascom, uh, those big conglomerates that actually own a lot of a lot of franchises, the the the, the big franchisees, um, in order to basically categorize all the merchants underneath them, and we built a holistic view of all the merchants in the region, such that when the transaction comes, we can cleanse with the exact name of the merchant. So, for example, Qatar Airways will have different names in different countries. For us, it will always be cleansed to Qatar Airways. And we then add a categorization on the, on the transaction and we categorize it as travel. So when we pass on the data to the, to the, to the FinTech or, or, or the, like a PFM, for example, instead of showing you the raw data, the raw transaction, which looks really ugly, you're able to see a very cleansed transaction and also able to categorize it. Uh, this is the first part. Essentially, we're, we've built an uh, endless number of insights, uh, sa uh, insights on your salary, how recurring the salary is, what's the variance in the salary with the rise of the gig economy, essentially. Your income is not uh, always the same. Uh, people, get, uh, people get paid different amounts. Like if you think about it, like an Uber driver, some months are better than, another, better than others. And so we can see the variance in the salary and how recurring it is therefore giving further insights to the merchants in order to uh, enable them to better to make better decisions on their low, uh, on the way they 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 loan um, on the way they issue loans sorry lastly which is the uh, a, a really uh, transformative feature um, uh, which is the payments api the ability for fintechs to initiate bank to bank transfers natively within the application uh, uh, we're basically an alternative to a traditional payment gateway. A traditional payment gateway will charge you any, anywhere between 2.5 to 3%. Merchants have suffered for a long time. Visa and MasterCard are exercising a real monopoly in, in the payment space. And essentially what Lean offers is the ability to bypass a Visa and MasterCard and just initiate bank-to-bank -bank transfers natively within an application. I'll give you actually quick demos on this. So I explained the, the problems faced by PFMs. Wally is a, is, is a typical PFM, a personal finance management application in, in the region that has built connections with all the banks across the world. They have connections to the US banks by a Plaid, connections to European banks by Soltedge, connections to UAE banks via Lean. And so what Wally is, uh, sorry, I'm just gonna go back here. What Wally is able to do, um, you'll see basically the flow of how users can share their data with Wally. Today, you can add a bank. They'll ask you to add a bank. As you can see, they have connections to pr pretty much uh, all the banks around the world. Uh, the customer will select UAE banks if they want to connect their UAE banks, which will trigger the Lean SDK, the Lean Software Development Kit. Lean will gather the permissions from the end user. They'll enable the user to share, to, con to, to select their bank, uh, we gathered specific permissions to, to basically tell the user what exactly, what kind of information we're actually getting to, uh, we're, we're, we're accessing. So we were able to look at their identity, transaction history, available balances, and, and to view their accounts. And once getting the customer's consent, and as you can see, the user is really abiding to our end user agreement and privacy notice here, uh, by making the relevant disclosures, we, the user actually knows what they're sharing. They connect their bank account, and all of a sudden, uh, all of their data that is custodied by their bank account gets populated into the, the Sarawa app. It's really our backend data that speaks to Wally's backend, and the data that is shared on the backend gets uh, Wally makes sense of this data and put it, puts it into, um, into an account. So as you can see, this customer linked their accounts. They can see all of their transactions. Uh, they can see their balance and so forth. Um, so a number of insights there. Uh, Sarwa, we touched upon that, the robo-advisor model. Sarwa is one of the leading global uh, advisors in the, in, the, in the region. 
uh, Sarwa was looking for a way to basically uh, uh, come up with a straightforward account funding process, which was very difficult before because uh, they had to, the users had to leave the app, go to their mobile application, add them as a beneficiary, and explain the process. But essentially through Lean, the user is enabled to, uh, can basically connect their bank account and initiate a transaction from within the Sarwa application. I'll show you a little bit more on this. How are we doing on time? Okay, I'll try to wrap it up. Uh, so here, sorry, I'm gonna go back a little bit. As you can see on Sarwa, before Lean, it was only the manual funding before open banking. Now through open banking, you have the easy funding process, not the manual one. So you go here, uh, the customer has already li linked their live account, but the customer here wants to add another bank account to initiate actually uh, their the transfer not from live, but actually, uh, I think in this case, it will be Citibank. Um, so again, the customer can select their bank, they will choose city. And again, the permissions are again, very central because the customer needs to be aware of who they're sharing their data with and what type of data they're sharing. So in this case, for payments, uh, the user uh, lean will request certain type of permissions, which is to view the account, to view the available balances in their account, and to manage the beneficiaries. So lean will automatically add Sarawa as a beneficiary to the user's city account. Once we gather that, uh, the username and password is entered, and I'm gonna, you can see the whole funding process is about less than a minute. Uh, we're going very slow here. We've added the beneficiary. The, the account has been authenticated. We've added the beneficiary. And so here, what you come up, you, you basically have two of your bank accounts now connected to the Sarwa application. And now you can go back and every time you wanna initiate a new transaction, every time you wanna top up your Sarwa account, you can either top it up from City or I, I top it up from Live. You don't need to reconnect it. It's connected only once and you can go on and make a transaction. So you select city, you enter into the, the amount into Sarwa, and you confirm the deposit within a matter of like 30 seconds, you've uh, 27 seconds to be precise, you've funded your account through bank to bank transfers, cutting the fees that Visa and MasterCard have charged with a delightful user experience. That's what open banking enables you to do today. That's the big shift in the, how financial services work. Um, I'm not, I'm gonna, because we're short on time, I'm just gonna go very quickly. And I really wanna touch upon, uh, upon Egypt because I, I think it's really a fascinating market for open banking and open finance. So if you think about Egypt today, if we look at it from a macro perspective, right? Um, Egypt uh, has about, 100 million people, north of 100 million people. Uh, more than 15% of their uh, of their population has a, a, a has our internet users. A high social media consumption. Average, the median age is a 20 is 24 years old. Uh, I think it's about 60 percent of the more than 60 percent of the population is less than 35. So very very ripe market for digital disruption. Um, and yet, what you realize in Egypt is that only 14% of the population has a bank account, of the adult population has a bank account, which is very low. So if you think about open banking, open banking really caters to that 14%, because open banking enables uh, you, uh, fintechs to access customers' bank, da uh, bank data, not any type of data. That's where you see the you have to think about the evolution of open banking towards open finance. If we think about open finance in, in Egypt, while well, people are underbanked in Egypt, yes, it's only 14% of the adult uh, uh, population with a bank account. In reality, uh, these customers still spend money, still have a lot of financial data. It's just not stored with the bank, it's stored elsewhere. So the interesting stat, which I, which I thought was mind blowing when, when a friend of mine sent me a presentation recently, was that there's 18 million bank accounts in Egypt for 20 million wallets. Wallets essentially have been democratized, democratized because it's the, the KYC is much, much less thorough as for a bank. It's much easier to get a wallet. 
And essentially it has the same purpose. It, it acts as a checking account that enables you to spend at merchants, which is the, the key principle behind it. So telcos in Egypt, such as Vodafone, uh, Tisalat and, and others uh, have captured a significant mar uh, market share in Egypt. And, and, and does that mean that this data cannot be accessed? Not really. Actually, this data, uh, there's a, a lot of data in a wallet. And similarly, uh, players like Faudi. With Faudi today, every single has, Faudi has built integrations with every single uh, national billing system uh, in Egypt. You can pay your, your essentially your electricity bill, your water, or your water. Uh, you can pay any your education, uh, you know, they're recognized by the Ministry of Education and so forth. Uh, having all of these transactions into Faudi, uh, anyone who get access to Faudi data can tell a lot about a certain user. So if a user is spending all their money via Faudi and all of their data is custodied by Faudi, Faudi is a, is a fintech. So people would think they're on, on the side of consuming the data. But on this, uh, at the same time, they, they are the custodian of a lot of financial data of their end users. And so what if other fintechs could consume, what if users actually could share their Faudi data with other third parties? It would tell them, uh, it would tell the merchant a lot about the, the user's uh, uh, financial life and how they're, how they're spending their money and their ability to repay a loan, for example. So that's really the guiding principle is really you're not really into, like getting the data from just banks. Every type of institution, financial institution or any type of fintech, any type of company in the world will have to open up the data that they store on, the, on, 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 on their customers because it's ultimately the consumer's right to share this data with any type of third party because the, the, the users, customers are the rightful owners of the data. Yes, that's 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 pretty much it. Wanted to wrap it up on a good note for Egypt, and uh, we'd love to get some questions. Okay, this is this was super 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 insightful. Yeah, I mean, thank you so much for that. I think if like if we closed now without any questions, this would have been super super insightful for us. Thank you so much, and I learned a lot, and I'm sure that every participant here learned a lot as well. And maybe I want to share a comment here from the the chat. Omar uh, wrote to you, slides are so well prepared. I haven't seen anything that 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 is uh, extraordinary like this before. Shout out for Mehdi and the content. So thank you so much for preparing such a uh, world-class uh, presentation and for your insights and um, and everything that you shared today. Well, full disclosure, so, Omar, I'm not the one who prepared this, this, <laughs> this presentation. <laughs> it was actually our team, so all credit goes to them. Okay, all credit goes to the, uh, uh, the Lean Technology uh, team. Uh, maybe we can start with uh, questions. We, I have a lot of questions in the QA and uh, chat, and I invite everyone who wants to like answer Mehdi any question. Maybe you can also write in the Q&A uh, box. Uh, the first question that I want to start with you with is about banks. Would this is a threat for banks somehow? So someone was asking, why would bank give you access to such data they would be losing, right? That's a good question. Uh, it's a good question. I'm actually like always are looking. I, I'm always looking for uh, further answer. Uh, the reality is, you can see it's twofold. Uh, some banks uh, globally see it as a compliance effort because the banks are the regulators that's actually mandating the bank to create these APIs. Uh, so a lot of it's just will push back on the central bank and just say like. And, and as much as they can, but ultimately they have to do that. So some people just see it as a compliance effort. Other banks though, see it as a commercial opportunity. So, and this is where the banking as a service uh, model comes in. If you think about banks uh, as the traditional uh, sort of banking sector was really, okay, banks would go and bundle all of these services together. Now, now that these services have been unbundled, right? Meaning that Revolut issued uh, checking accounts. Um, uh, Blend was issuing mortgages, fintech applications uh, issuing a mortgage. Uh, um, uh, companies like Monzo issuing credit cards and other type of comp crypto companies such as Coinbase 
uh, and and by uh, Binance issuing crypto and uh, Coinmina basically uh, allowing you to invest in crypto, Sarawa allowing you to in invest in Sarawa. So those are, those services have been unbundled by financial by 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 fintechs, and so these companies are actually getting a lot of the market share. But banks have a unique advantage. Banks are actually trusted by third parties, by, by users, or by customers. Everyone trusts their bank. So banks that actually, uh, that actually are, 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 are working on open banking before, there is a tremendous first mover advantage. The first bank that will create these APIs and work with fintechs, for example, with server customers. I'll give a very simple example. Uh, Robin Hood in the US worked uh, with banks in order because they were a lot of people were investing their money on Robin Hood. Sometimes that money was sitting idle in the Robin Hood account, right? So what Robin Hood essentially did is they went to a bank in the US, I'm, I'm probably JP Morgan uh, or, or another one. They went to a bank and said, look, uh, we have all of this money sitting in this account. Why don't we give it to you? We're not using that. Why don't we give it to you? You custody the, 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 because we don't have any type of lending services. So if the money sits there, we would rather just give it to you. You're hosted in a savings account where you get you give two to 3% um, uh, uh, um, returns on, 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 on the money. And people also were issued a Robinhood uh, debit card, right? Uh, and so people actually could go now uh, through, the, thanks to the banking services that are offered by JP Morgan, they actually, Robinhood was basically acting like a bank. But the, the beneficiary of that was also the bank who was getting more deposits and therefore could lend more to potential uh, participants. So it's, I'm not saying it's, it's the biggest commercial opportunity. There are some commercial opportunities. And of course, uh, it creates more, more threats in the sense that there's more competition, but competition is healthy. It, pu it, it pushes banks to also innovate. Clear, clear. So speaking of commercial opportunity, I guess someone is here asking about the, the, the revenue model. So, so open banking is about data and data sharing and, and, and things like that. So how do you guys make money and who is the, the people involved in this process that take like costs from the end customers? Uh, it's very good. So the way open banking has been designed is that banks are not allowed to share, uh, to charge for the sharing of data. So meaning the bank that creates the data APIs are not able to charge when they pass this data to a third party. So the main, so the ones that are actually there the, that are basically charging here are the aggregators, so lean in the middle. And basically the way we charge is every time you call the data, anytime the, 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 the merchant, we calls the data from the bank, upon the customer's re request, we'll charge an API call, and that call is charged to the merchant. So the users do not pay usually for these services, right, for sharing their data. The merchant is actually paying. Clear as well. So Iman here was asking that, like, thank you for explaining the, the difference between the market driven and the regulatory driven uh, uh, open banking. So Iman has a question that is related to uh, that market driven open banking is growing very, very fast, but this actually could like formulate a risk since it is not actually a part of like an official institutional framework. So how do you see that? So it's a, it's a good, very, very good question. Um, uh, that's that the market driven uh, the market driven uh, approach has some risks in the sense that uh, you have unlicensed players uh, basically getting access to the data. And so this is where we are always pro some sort of regulation uh, to govern who are the key uh, the key market participants that have the right license. For example, I'll, I consider the UAE as a market driven market uh, like a, a market driven uh, a country that has adopted the market driven approach. We as Lean are still regulated. We're regulated by the Abu Dhabi Global Markets FSRA, so we. We abide by the, the, the by the the rules that the the FS, FSRA places upon us, 
but we go beyond, right? In the UAE, which doesn't have a, 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 a data storage policy, a local data storage policy, we, we go further. For us, the data never leaves the sovereign or the data is stored locally on local, on local cloud servers. Um, it's up to the TPPs to sort of put these standards on themselves. Um, I, sometimes it's, it's, it's not ideal, but the ones that will win, ultimately there will be some sort of regulation everywhere. And the ones that will win are the ones that have adopted the highest security standards and, and have built the best product. But I do think security is at, is at the core. For example, at Lean, we consider ourselves a cyber secure, we're a data aggregator, but we consider ourselves a, a cyber security company first. Security is the utmost, uh, is the number one getting principle in this company. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, speaking of security, we, we had here a very like hot argument between Mustafa and Ihab on which uh, open banking would actually invade uh, the idea of cons customer privacy. So how do you see customer privacy with regards to open banking? So I, I, do, I, I think this is a, a, a big misconception. Um, the user actually is the one who gives their specific consent to share the data with a third party. It's everything is consent driven. As I showed you sort of on, on our software development kit, there's several screens, which one makes the relevant disclosure. We tell the, the users uh, that want to share their data that we're nationally regulated, that we the here are privacy policies, here are encryption policies, then they go on to select their bank and we make another type of, uh, we get a, another type of permissions. Here's what we're accessing. Here's how we're gonna make sense of the data. And also here's what we cannot do. For example, if you, sh if you connect with your data API, you cannot, we cannot make payments. We cannot manage beneficiaries. There's a certain set of permissions that we, not, we, we don't get. And so therefore we won't get access to. And lastly, which is the last, uh, the last piece, the user actually signs an end user agreement with the data processor to, to, to consent to the sharing of data for us to access and sharing the data. So there's like a clear contract that is signed between the end user and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and the data provider. There's something that I, me personally want to understand. So, so with open banking, you don't need like applications like AKYC or like any kind of identity verification because open banking already does that, right? Uh, it's a tricky one. So um, uh, if you ask me, um, I do believe in, in still like uh, EKYC providers. I think they, they're, they're definitely uh, um, really, really important in the, in the ecosystem. Uh, so in market driven, uh, in the market driven approach, it really depends on this, uh, on how it's standard, like on the guidelines. In some markets where it's clearly, where the identity API works really well, right? Uh, and passes on all the relevant data, then this could be considered a, a KYC, right? Rel enough KYC, but it really depends on, on the data that is shared uh, and not all banks, will give you the same data. Some banks display uh, your national identity numbers, some banks don't. Some banks sh share your phone number, some banks don't. So I'm not sure if it's a full KYC process yet. It might be in the future. At the very least, it's smart onboarding, meaning that uh, you can pre-fill the, enti the, the, the entire sort of onboarding process. Okay. For Clear. So we, we spoke today about open banking and then open ends and then open data, but we want to have like a, a, a timeline for like how those things are being like implemented and we see it adapted everywhere. So, and, and you have this year is also, is also asking another question on the challenges that, that you face uh, with growth in the MENA region compared to markets like US and UK. I'll tackle these uh, these uh, two questions separately. Um, adoption, it's there. Um, the the Saudi central bank has come up with the guidelines. Bank of Bahrain has come up with the guidelines. The UAE went full steam ahead with open banking in a market driven approach. So it's it's happening. Hopefully, coming soon to Egypt. I am very keen to uh, sit down with the central bank. Uh, define the guidelines. Obviously, 
uh, you have to understand that the, the central banks usually do not come up with the guidelines by themselves. Uh, they actually consult the banks, the financial institutions, they consult the key fintechs, Lean being one of them. We've been consulted many, many times throughout the whole process by the Saudi Central Bank. Hisham is originally Saudi, born and raised in Khoba, um, and has spent a lot of time with Sama defining what are, would be the best standards. So we actually were very vocal about what we didn't want to see and what we wanted to see. And Sama was, was very receptive to our feedback. And I think we should really have see that type of collaboration between banks, fintechs, and, and even sometimes uh, uh, certain types of, of other regulatory bodies like associations, the MENA fintech association, GIZ and others to sort of like come together and define what would be the best implementation of open banking in a certain market. I'm coming to Egypt next week and I would definitely welcome those conversations. Uh, the second part, which I didn't tackle, sorry. Uh, can you remind me the second part, uh, which what are the challenges we're facing, right? Um, actually, selfishly, I'll say that our challenges are our biggest opportunity. Every single market has a different uh, regulation, a different regulator. Uh, they have different API specifications, meaning that uh, it's a lot of conversations with different markets. It's a very fragmented market. There's a lot of banks to, uh, to connect to. Um, and all of these banks have different infrastructure, so different API specifications for us to connect to. However, for Lean, selfishly, again, this is the opportunity, right? Because we have the best engineers, because we have the best technical team, we're able to build unique uh, connections with these banks, therefore providing a universal uh, standardized API for fintechs to connect to these users' bank accounts. Our value as an aggregator derives from the fragmentation in the market. So <laughs> for me, I see it both as a, as a sort of a, uh, a threat, but also a, an opportunity. Uh, Sam, I think you froze. I'm not sure if it's actually me that froze. Um, maybe I did froze. Freeze, sorry. Um, okay, I'll just start reading some of these questions. We would do the same insurance companies to imagine combining health as well as financial data together. I do think that combining health and financial data and insurance data together would be a massive, massive opportunity, massive shift in the market. Uh, I do think this will happen very soon. Uh, very good question, uh, Jamal. Um, I'm, I'm, I think we, we, we're, we're definitely have plans to aggregate uh, insurance and healthcare data down the line. Uh, sounds good, uh, Jamal. I, I look forward. To, uh, you have an idea. I'm looking forward to hearing more about it and uh, and, and 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 connecting uh, separately. Uh, Omar uh, also has. Are you able to start integrating with banks in Egypt, or will it be blocked by regulators? Um, uh, it's a TBD. We're actually doing a lot of market study, and we're engaging with. Uh, we're going to start engaging with the central bank. Uh, I'll be able to answer this question after my trip to Egypt. Uh, so I'll keep you posted, Omar. I hope we can connect separately. Okay. Uh, Apologies for that. Uh, you already picked a couple of questions. There's also someone asking about how can they make use of. Can you hear me cl uh, clearly, Mehdi? Yeah, I can, I can hear you clearly. Yeah. Okay, so someone was asking that, how would a fintech working in Egypt integrate with you? So, uh, so actually, that's the beautiful thing about our software is, is essentially it's one integration uh, that's universal. So it's the same integration that, that will enable you to access bank data in Egypt, bank data in Saudi, bank data in, in uh um, in any market in the MENA plus Turkey and Pakistan region, we completely abstract fintechs and developers from the nuances of the infrastructure of the banks. So it's there's a really Chinese wall, fintechs connect to one API, they embed it into their application, and they get access to our services. So actually, if you go to, to leantech.me and, and look at our sandbox, you can start integrating today. 
and play around with our sandbox environment, which is basically mock data uh, that's also tailored to the needs of Egypt. So one one question I was all I was also very curious about with regards to blockchain. So you mentioned that you're doing something with Talal. So I was wondering what is the relationship between open banking and blockchain? How those two disruptive technologies can come together? Uh, sorry, do you mind repeating that? Yes. Yeah, so, so what is the, the, the things or how is the integration are going, is going to work between blockchain and open banking? So uh, Coimina is a blockchain platform. It, it, it's basically still an application, right? So basically Coimina, um, we, we as, a, as, a, as an open banking platform, we can work with any type of companies. What happens in, 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 in uh, Coimina's backend doesn't really matter to us they actually integrate our API into their flow. Our flow is compatible with blockchain companies. It's, uh, it's basically really compatible with any type of merchants. Yes, okay, got you. But, but Bardo, to, 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 to give you like more uh, of a context, so, so blockchain is basically about like peer-to-peer -peer and, uh, yeah, and controlling, controlling data. So do you think that with the evolution of blockchain and like having like the, the threat that, or not the threat, but rather the opportunity that the blockchain is replacing everything and it's changing the financial infrastructure as we know it today. Do you think that this is also formulated threat on open banking? Very good question. Actually, we had a discussion with um, with the guys at um, at Tink, which was recently acquired for, for, for $2 billion by Visa. And I, I asked this question, I don't have an answer today, to be perfectly honest. Blockchain applications, they're still like three to five years away. Uh, real blockchain applications, three, five years away. Uh, so it's very hard to say because we haven't seen mass adoption of blockchain uh, applications like of maybe NFTs and, <laughs> and these type of things. I'm, 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 I'm not that bullish to be perfectly on these type of, uh, <laughs> I, I think there's a lot more, uh, there's a lot of noise there. But again, that's my first okay. So I don't have a straight, like a real answer on this. Okay, got you. So maybe maybe one final question we can end with is that someone asked about actually the competition. So with every technology that's going to be adapted, there's another technology that is actually vanishing in a way. So someone was asking about MasterCard and Visa and whether that idea of open banking would, would eliminate the use of electronic banks or bank cards. Eliminate, I don't know. Uh, it, it, it is definitely eating a lot of the market share. That's how, that's for sure. Um, that's why Visa has tried to acquire Plaid. It failed, which is the largest data aggregator in the world. Acquisition was actually blocked by the regulators in the US because they wanted to promote more competition. They actually are in the process of trying to acquire uh, the largest aggregator in Europe. Uh, it seems like it's going through. A MasterCard just announced two days ago that they're acquiring uh, there are another aggregator in, 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 in Europe. They already acquired financially the US. So definitely the incumbents uh, see it as a, as a massive threat. Uh, I would welcome everyone to look at the DOJ's report on, visa, on the visa and plat acquisition, which was really fascinating. And it tells you a little bit like the size of the open banking opportunity and how it's like really transformed, like a transformational uh, sort of a shift away from traditional banking into, into... Okay. Okay. There's uh, also a lot of questions that I see as, as being uh, duplicated. So we usually share the recording with everyone. So if you guys jump late, you can still watch the, this episode again uh, while well, after we send the link. Uh, there was also a, a request that we share with, uh, with participants, the presentation, Mehdi, and your LinkedIn profile as well. So if one, anyone wants to join to you, reach out to you, maybe he can like uh, send you uh, on LinkedIn. Would that be okay? I would love that. Please, please okay. do reach out. Uh, really look, looking forward to connecting separately. And uh, once again, um, Hassan, thank you so much for for, for for the for the invitation, always delightful to take part in these uh, in in these events, and look forward to seeing you soon uh, in Egypt. Thank you, Mehdi. This was super super insightful, and I'm very very grateful for you and for your time, and for giving us this very very insightful one hour session. 
And thanks uh, also to everyone who attended today. Uh, next week, uh, the third week, we will actually hear from one of uh, يعني, uh, a very good uh, friend of mine, a very good, a very interesting founder as well, Ahmed Hamouda, the CEO of uh, Thunder. He will tell us more about social investing and the revolution of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, 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 payment and exchanging value. Um, Wednesday, 6 p.m. We will look. Uh, we're looking very much looking forward to having you all. Uh, thank you again, Mehdi. Today, this was very very insightful, and I'm very much looking forward to meeting you this week, inshallah, next week. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye bye.